Hi, welcome to the Sojourner's Walk. In this tour, we hope that you can take a view of another side of Singapore. Sojourn, the word in English means to stay as a temporary resident, contributing, enriching, and when it's time, move on. Sojourn is another meaning and that meaning is slightly negative. It means to be kept as a temporary resident. We will explore both in due course as we discuss the migration experience of a migrant worker. Here's a quote from Alice in Wonderland. When I use the word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I chose it to mean, neither more or less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many things. In the case of your tour today, what if we substitute the word word by including an alphabet and changing it to the word world? Can the world mean different things to different people despite being a fixed geographic point? The Sojourner's Walk itinerary is designed for you to perhaps enter the looking glass to see these other parts of Singapore that you may not have seen because your social lenses is very different from the ones used to view Singapore through the Sojourners or the migrant workers population. The structure of this briefing basically is in the first part, I'll take you through some theory and look at reality and that hopefully will introduce you to the very different world that exists in this place called Singapore depending on whether you're a citizen or a more privileged member of society versus a migrant workers who are seen as unwanted immigrants someone who should be here temporarily work contribute and then sent home after the hopefully not too boring bits of lecture and briefing, we will start the actual tour. And here is the itinerary for your tour once this briefing has ended. The very first place you will visit is this place called Bangladeshi Square. It is this amazing little square off Deska Road that will be transformed every Sunday into one of the most crowded places you can ever be in within Singapore. After that, depending on your program, you, you have some tea and samosa at a Bangladeshi restaurant or some of you may have dinner. And depending on the order or planning by your guide, you may sometimes do grocery shopping with the migrants before your tea time or before your dinner. And an additional optional activity that we may have would be the cutting open of jackfruit and will end for us to codify your learning with a reflection and perhaps a call to action. Okay, so that's a program structure, briefing, tour, then reflection time. Step one, the Bangladeshi Square, or what locals call Bangla Square. That's the place that you'll be visiting. And the second stop will be the tiffin and conversation segment where you either have dinner or you have tea and in that section, you're encouraged to have conversations. So if you take a look at this, this is from a previous trip. Um, and if you look at it carefully, there's a little bit of problem with the geography of this occasion, because you'll find that the Bangladeshi or our migrant workers is in one side of the table where the tour participant is grouped among themselves and another side. I strongly encourage you to perhaps basically mingle or invite the foreign workers to sit amongst you so that while you are discussing about what you saw, you can have meaningful conversations with the migrant workers amongst you for them to explain what their off day is like, what their social life is like, and what are some of the things they do, or you can even have conversations about their hopes, dreams, and aspirations. Mingle, have conversation, learn, and perhaps you will see the humanity behind the label known as migrant workers. Stop three, and this sometimes could be stop two, so swap with the previous stop. You will visit 
a provision store within the vicinity of Bangladeshi Square to see what kind of grocery Bangladeshi foreign workers buy to bring back to their dorm in order to cook. Some of it may look familiar, some of it may not. It might be interesting for all of you to basically again have conversations and talk a little bit about day-to-day -day life. In order to help you make the most of your learning, the next step, I'll talk a little bit about how to navigate this through the living glass experience huh? where reality might be inverted, where the very Singapore you see looks very familiar and yet somehow very foreign. And the whole purpose of doing this tour is to try to enable you to grow your empathy by looking through the looking glass. And we hope you will learn from what you see. In navigating through a very different Singapore from the one that you may be used to or comfortable with, hopefully it will expose to you that there's always this constant contestation of spaces that exist beyond our sight. There is a Singapore we see as a more privileged community, and there is a Singapore that less privileged members of our community have to carve out in order to create a social space for themselves. In Singapore, there are many pockets of such spaces, such as Little India in Serangoon Road, where you'll be touring. There's also a Little Myanmar at Peninsula that is there because the Myanmar Consulate is situated in that area. And there are little Philippines that first started out in Lucky Plaza and now, to a certain extent, occupy Topaya Central on Sundays where Filipino domestic helper congregate for their social gathering. And little Indonesia, where Indonesian domestic helper frequent in Gelang Serai or Juchet area. In being able to navigate through the looking glass experience, you must make your observation your teacher. The best way to frame your learning is to use something called reflection. Now, if you were to do it haphazardly, you might find it confusing and you may miss an important point. And so here I'm going to introduce a methodology that you may have encountered in your university life or in your education called the deal reflection structure. So here's a little bit of revision if you've ever come across it. If not, this is a very quick introduction. The deal structure and art of conversation, how to maximize your learning through reflection and hopefully that will help you also construct conversation with the migrant worker who's your tour guide today. How do you use reflection and what is the deal structure? Well, the word deal is an acronym and comprises of describe, examine, articulate learning. It provides a structure for us to review what we have learned in order to maximize our learning. So what is this structure? Let's go into it in slightly more detail now. The first word of the acronym deal is the word describe. In describing, you are trying to recall objectively your experience. So focus on the moments that surprise you or what I would call the what the heck moments. This would be information observations that are surprising to you, shocking, puzzling, frustrating, or illustrative of differences between you and the population you are trying to understand. In examine, you are trying to analyze using three lenses to understand the what the heck moments talked about earlier. And we do it through a personal lens, things that are intensely personal to us or from a personal point of view. And we'll look at a civic point of view from a social perspective or from a civic duty point of view. And finally, an academic perspective where we try to meld our learning to some of the theories or lessons that we may have learned back in the classroom. So these are the three lenses. Let's start off with personal. In this aspect, you want to make use of your personal feeling. For example, you want to focus on how did I feel seeing a Singapore redefined through our foreign workers view? How did my feelings change at the end? What are my stereotypes of foreign workers? And how have my assumptions changed at the end? Or how have my stereotypes been challenged or broken by this short, simple little walk? And more importantly, 
because we're dealing with a personal, we we'll want to look at your potential personal growth. How have I grown or benefited as a person because of this engagement or not? Reflect. The next lens that we can look at is to examine society. And here we can ask the simple question, have our society messed up? Maybe messed up is too harsh a word. Where have our society sort of stutter socially and how can we improve as a society? And here you want to make use of your observation of the role of a society and how this has been challenged as a result of this little walk. So here, perhaps you might want to focus on your civic duty beyond your professional duty. Perhaps a question like this may help. How would I as a future professional benefit from such social awareness? Where are the gaps and weakness of our society in the treatment of foreign workers? What are some hidden contribution of our foreign workers that are hidden from our consciousness and why is it important for us to be aware of that? And perhaps more importantly, what can I as a future professional or an engaged citizen do to build a better society? And perhaps within here, an additional question, can we benefit as we strive to do good civic perspective? Huh? How the concept of a stronger society is a society with lesser weak links and if we strengthen the weak link how does society in general strengthen as well so examine we can do it from a civic perspective the last lens in the examine section is something called academic and here you can look at linking what you've seen today that may challenge some of the academic assumptions that you may have so in this tour has it enhanced the theories or knowledge from your classroom? If you study about prejudice and discrimination, do you see it in action? If you talk about economics, how, what have the things that you've seen in this section challenges the assumption that foreign workers only take money out and do not put money into Singapore's economy? And in doing so, you may have to dig deep within you and look at what kind of theories you may have find useful that may help you understand the challenges faced by the foreign workers. While learning in the classroom provides a safe environment, learning in a classroom is inherently artificial and because it's artificial, there will always be a lag between the theories that are discussed in the classroom and the reality out in the society. So the last point perhaps that you can look at is what are the gaps between learning in a classroom and real life and how do you maximize your learning by reducing or minimizing the gaps. And in doing so perhaps, how do you drive your own learning? How do you maximize the efficiency of the theories that you acquire in a classroom in order for you to build a better society or become a more agile professional? The last part of the deal structure is something called articulate learning. And in this case, you're invited to apply your experience to strengthen your learning. How do you build on your experience? Here are some of the questions you can ask. What did I learn? How specifically did I learn it? You know, what aspect is of the tour? What aspect of the walk? And how does a short little walk of less than a kilometer trigger learning? And if it's useful, the next question becomes interesting. Why does this learning matter? Why is it important? And in what ways will I use this learning? What goal shall I set in accordance with what I've learned in order to improve myself or the quality of my learning or the quality of my future? Whichever profession you're in, there will be use of what you've learned today, but the use can only come if you learn how to apply it. How will you apply it? Let's use an additional theory to scaffold your learning. Here we're going to use Meso's hierarchy. It's a very simple psychological theory on how our potential can be reached if we had enough social psychological support. A common theory, and you may have heard of it before, and let's just revise them. At the base level is something called physiological need. Second level is something called security or safety needs. The third level is love and belonging. Fourth level is something called esteem needs. 
and when all those are met we are likely to achieve our maximum potential or what may so call self-actualization the bottom four layers are what we call deprivation needs huh? if we are deprived we will need to overcome it in order to fulfill our potential the apex of the pyramid represents the achievement of potential okay, so now let's look at how being a foreign worker in Singapore will result in us facing certain problems that prevent us from achieving each of those deprivation needs. Okay, D needs one, physiological. This refers to biological survival. Huh? So what are some challenges faced by foreign workers in this need? Well, it would be the lack of rest, physical fatigue, long working hours, short resting time, physically challenging job. This lack of rest would result in the inability of our body to repair and therefore being chronically tired would then take away our ability or energy to do greater or higher things. Lack of sleep health. Foreign workers averaging about five hours of sleep. This is a study done by civil servants as highlighted in the site, Hack for Public Good. Lack of nutritious food and often a lack of access to medicine to treat illness or injuries resulting in the lack of pain management or the inability to fully get well. Physiological threats uh, as a result of some of these. So some statistics to show us the kind of environment that foreign workers work in. If you look at the total workplace injuries, the total for 2023 is about 22,787 or we can round it off to roughly about 23,000 and this number most likely will be underreported compared to the actual number of injuries and later on we'll discuss why there is underreporting. It is not in the employer's interest to be transparent about injuries because if they have more workplace injuries, they might be fined or they might be marked down by manpower ministry. And so sometimes employers may put pressure on foreign workers not to see doctors or report injuries, therefore creating a further threat to their physiological need. Next la layer, D needs two, we're looking at the security needs. There must be no threat to our psychological health. And challenges faced by foreign workers in these needs would be things like financial security. They have to pay a lot, a lot of money to be able to come to Singapore to work, and that's the concept of recruitment fee. They typically pay anywhere between five to eight thousand or even more in order to secure a trip to Singapore to find work. So which also meant that often in the first year, they are working without salary and they are worried that they'll lose their job because the minute they lose their job, they'll be sent home. And that is under employment security. The work permit holder effectively is an immigration control tool, which means that the, a lot of power is given in favour of the employers, but not the workers. So in this particular case, if the foreign workers meet an abusive employer, the foreign workers cannot resign because by the very fact of resignation, foreign workers will be out of a work permit visa because the work permit visa is linked to the employer. So you now have this very terrible situation to a certain extent where an employer can fire, but the foreign workers really cannot resign, eh? even in the face of uh, extreme exploitation. Emotional security, hidden antagonism from the whole society. There is a lot of pressure to keep foreign workers apart from the rest of Singapore. And some of us who are here may have certain stereotypes or prejudice that are socialized in us by our society. That is what is called the hidden antagonism. Sometimes our discrimination or racism is real. Sometimes our discrimination and racism is hidden. We are not aware that we are racist, but our acts and our social choices shows there is. But if you are the foreign workers, coming from a very weakened political and social situation, you will sense that you are unwanted and that constitute a form of 
emotional security threat. If you look at the previous statistics from the earlier slide, physical security, the foreign workers often have to work in very, very high risk environment and that constitute a constant threat to their security. Yeah? So D needs two, security, the life of the foreign workers often present a lot of obstacles to them being able to achieve the security need and therefore do well. Some statistics, example of threat to financial security. Here is an, a news article in uh, Channel News Asia talking about migrant workers paying thousands of dollars for a job that may never materialize. This article give a very, very good discussion on how the recruitment industry sometimes is not for the benefit of the foreign workers. Threats to emotional and psychological security. Let's look at this concept called stress and how it affects our ability to function. Huh? And here we're going to look at stress in relation to the foreign workers being able to seek medical help. Now don't get me wrong, stress in itself is not evil. We need stress to motivate us, but too much stress will hold us back. Huh? So if you look at the bell curve, this is the stress bell curve. The example out there basically looks at either office worker or let's just use the case of a student. If you're on the green zone and the yellow zone, you're fairly good. Huh? The green and yellow zone means that the stress will motivate us to be able to work. So let's look at the blue zone. When you have no stress at all, you're not likely to work, right? So for instance, if I were to say, as your lecturer, if you happen to be a student, that whatever you do, I promise you, I'll give you an A+. That might produce a, what we call an underloading of stress, which then meant that you're more likely to prioritize your effort in, the, in your studies on subjects that are more threatening or rather more stressful. So no stress, no work, low performance. Huh? So if you look at the blue section. So which then tells us we need a little bit of stress in order to motivate us. And that's represented by the green zone. It's called optimum stress. Huh? Top of the bell curve represents something called the fatigue point. Fatigue point means that beyond that, we are no longer coping. So while stress is still motivating us, but we're kind of struggling a little bit. So the green zone is represented perhaps by a fair amount of stress that motivate us to work without hurting us. For instance, grades. If there's no impact on grade, we will not study. That is the blue zone. But if we know that if we put in a little more effort, we will get the B, we might get the A, and that will help us a lot in the future. That little bit of stress that comes with understanding if I don't revise, I will not get those grades, will push us to work. But if I'm taking seven or eight subjects, and seven or eight subjects are all very stressful, then we hit past fatigue point or exhaustion point, even though we know that we have to put in effort in order to achieve the rewards. But if we're too tired, we're then get to the point where we no longer could do it, our brain could absorb the different materials that we have to comprehend and we start to then underperform. So too much stress gets to that. Now in the case of the foreign workers, based on what we've discussed so far, you'll find that perhaps a lot of them might be in the red zone where they are facing a lot of stress in multiple, multiple fronts that resulted in them being unable to achieve success in their life. In fact, they might be severely limited as a result. That is called the burnout point or the breakdown point. Too much stress, our system just shut down. Now, if we look at the concept of healthcare, when you look at a person who's just barely coping on multiple front, you will find that stress will create what is called a state of medical non-compliance. Why? Well, I've got to work rather than go see a doctor because if I don't work, I don't get paid. If I don't get paid, I cannot clear my recruitment debt. If I don't get paid, my family suffer. So therefore, I must prioritize money over my health. That's the concept of how stress can limit someone's health. Let's look at D needs number three, love and belonging. And in this particular case, we need to look at social inclusion this particular level, there must be no threat to our sociological assistance. 
we must feel belonged, we must feel loved, we must feel our ability to connect with another person. So the challenges faced by foreign workers in this state will be real or perceived discrimination from the Singaporean society. They are fairly mid to long term separation from their family, people who cares about them, whom they care about, lack of separation between work and social life. Any of you have worked before, you know that employers are not our friend. They may become our friend, but during the work environment, they are not. So therefore, we need space away from work. And that's why Singapore is increasingly moving into a five-day week. There are discussion of moving into a four-day week. For a lot of the foreign workers, their work day is six days and may even stretch to six and a half days. And each of the day, they probably have to do quite a fair bit of overtime in order to repay their financial debt. So remember the threats to security. So therefore, the average work day may be in the regions of 12, 14 hours and very low psychological downtime. So lack of separation between work and social life. And lack of social life, in the sense that if you look at the foreign workers, they are all housed in a dorm. They are bused from the place of work to the place they live. Then in the morning, bus from the place they live to the place of work. There is very little opportunity for them to even meet their friends or relatives who may currently be working as foreign workers in Singapore as well. So lack of social life, huh? love and belonging is therefore threatened. Let's look at an example of this social dislocation. And here we're gonna provocatively use the word apartheid, most infamously linked to South Africa. And apartheid is the racist law that says that racial groups cannot mix uh, social segregation. Singapore doesn't practice it, but do we see shades of it? Let's look at what is granted to more powerful members of society, the citizens and PR, and what kind of living condition is pushed upon people we see as unwanted immigrants or the workers holding the work permit visa. The rate outline you see in this map is the Marine Parade GRC. And let's look at this particular constituency that gave its name, Marine Parade, a suburban area. And Marine Parade population is about 46,400 people thereabouts. While highly dense, this 46,400 people is distributed into 58 blocks of HB flats. So you'll find that while Singapore is one of the most dense countries in the world, we managed to overcome it by building lots of flats and we build it vertically. If you look at your own living condition as more privileged members of society, you will find that most of us still have reasonable access to personal space. So maybe two or three or maximum four person in the usual family structure these days occupying maybe a three room flat or larger so we have access to space if you're a foreign worker on work permit this is quite entirely different society wants to keep foreign workers isolated from the rest so you will find that the foreign workers generally are often housed in giant or mega dormitories so from the day I arrived in Singapore, I will be sent to the dormitory I've been assigned to live. And so let's use the example of Sungai Tengah Lodge huh, in Old Chua Chu Kang Road. It's an area that is nowhere near the size of Marine Parade constituency. It's probably less than one to two square kilometers in total area. 25,000 foreign workers are living there in 10 blocks of 13 storey building. So you're looking at half the population density of Marine Parade living in an area that's probably less than a tenth of Marine Parade itself. So huge, huge density. And all of them probably live within an area or room less than a three room flat, 12 to a room in these 10 blocks of dormitory buildings. Until COVID-19, they do not have ensuite toilets and even now, some of the blocks still don't have ensuite toilets which means that if you go by floors, there might be 10 rooms of 12 people each and they may have to share a common toilet. Huh? That is the key reasons behind the fact that COVID-19 is particularly devastating for foreign workers 
people live in a dorm, I spread very quickly in the dormitory. Our lessons from that on where we've gone wrong has resulted in, thankfully, corrective actions such as the retrofitting of these dormitories in order to provide on suite toilet inside each of these dormitory rooms. Huh? So now 12 person now may actually get to have a toilet within their room rather than having to queue up with hundreds of people just to use a toilet in a particular morning just before getting to work. So let's go on to the next D needs, esteem. Self-esteem is defined as recognition for our work. So if we are recognized for the work we have done, we will feel a little bit better about ourselves because we're getting positive feedback about us about what we have done right or constructive feedback on where we've gone wrong so that we can continue to improve. So our self-esteem is managed by this exchange. Huh? When you look at the foreign workers, the challenges faced by the foreign workers in DC would be the concept of underemployment. A lot of us think of foreign workers as uneducated, but they are not. A lot of them may have degrees. A lot of them may have diplomas and they are working in the construction industry because Working as a construction worker may pay them more than being an English teacher in their home country. Yeah? So, concept underemployment. So, imagine any of us who's been through universities but is forced to be a construction worker because that's the only job I can get in a foreign country. You can be sure that our self esteem will be challenged. And assuming that we're in the right frame of mind, we know that we are working hard because we need to do this for our family. The lack of positive reinforcement for the work I'm doing in this new job may again hit our self-esteem. So you'll find that if the employer is just focusing on the KPIs or key performance indicators on what has to be produced rather than what has been produced well, then this lack of recognition or contribution would further damage our esteem. And in this case, in the last two points, I'm talking about how someone may come here and be committed to being a construction worker and committed to doing well because it is in their interest to do well because then they can be hopefully promoted or get a new contract. But if there is only criticism and never praise, then we may have esteem issues. So you will find that in the management of foreign workers, what are some of these things? Up to now, we've discussed about the four deprivation needs. I've given you some facts, and these facts may challenge some of your assumptions. Now, don't just take my word for it. In the tour that you'll be embarking, do have meaningful conversations with the foreign workers who are your tour guides. Don't just look at Little India, look at their life, explore their life. Discover Little India, but also discover what life is like in a place like Singapore if the country or the society known as Singapore doesn't want you to be a long-term resident. How are you treated? D needs four. And here, let's play a little quiz, right? If I were to ask you what is the value of foreign worker to Singapore, what would be the number that you'll give me? After the moment has passed, let's look at this scientifically, not emotionally. One way to calculate the value of foreign workers in Singapore would be to look at industry links to foreign workers. And the very fact they have a heavy presence of foreign workers that contribute to the industry being able to function in Singapore. And in order to understand the total economic value of Singapore, we have to look at this economic concept called Gross Domestic Product or GDP. The total GDP of Singapore is fairly high. We're looking at about the $673 billion in 2023. Yeah? That's the value of our economy. It's huge. Of which 43.5% of the sectors represented here needed foreign workers or your collapse. So we're looking at places like manufacturing. We're looking at construction, perhaps even utilities. We're looking at retail trade increasingly. We're looking at food and beverage services. We're looking at other services and perhaps support services as well. So if you add up all those areas in which foreign workers are heavily employed in, it comes up to roughly around 43.5 or 44%. Once we get hold of these facts, foreign workers' involvement and the total value of GDP, conceivably we can calculate 
the value of foreign workers, right? Because if we were to re remove foreign workers from the equation here, those sectors may collapse. And so if you take 0 0.44 times 673 billion, we can come up with a fairly scientific number that the foreign workers is worth $29.3 billion to Singapore because they help generate the amount. So worth quite a lot, right? Yet how many of us attribute our economic success to the foreign workers and accord them the respect that comes along with that huge contribution to our economy? Very few of us might, right? Esteem, huh? D needs four. And DNIS 5 is something called self-actualization. There must be a facilitation to help us build our potential. We cannot assume we can easily reach that potential. That potential is negotiated for and nourished by society. In this particular case, the key challenges faced by foreign workers in this need would be a highly restrictive visa limiting the permanent resident. For foreign workers holding a work permit, there is no meritocratic process of assessment. I do my job very well. I get five contract renewals. I've been in Singapore for 10 years. I may reach what is called a supervisor post. My salary may go up, but if I want to make Singapore my home, I may still face great obstacles. Huh? In other words, what I contribute and what I do doesn't eventually get represented in bringing my hopes and dreams to the front. D needs five. And here you will find that the key problem may be the fact that the work permit visa is not just simply a work visa, it is also to a certain extent an immigration control device. Again, have conversation with your foreign workers tour guide on what are some of the restrictions placed by the work permit visas. By the way, if you're on the work permit visa, you, in order for you to date and eventually marry a Singaporean, you need permission from the Manpower Ministry. If not, your work permit might be cancelled and you might be deported. Self-actualization, not a D-need, but the achievement of our psychological aspiration. Here is the FAQ on work permit. You will find that the ability to stay in Singapore to work if you're in this lower category or so-called lower category of worker is two years and every two years have to be renewed. And therefore, there's great insecurity. If you're a foreign worker looking at long-term employment in a place like Singapore, there's simply no such things because of the limitation placed on the foreign workers on this thing called the work permit. Here's a little bit more about the Salvation Army Sojourn Program and what we do. The Sojourn Program is a Salvation Army mission and it essentially support the foreign workers on issues faced by them. And the key needs or key points of interest is to serve the foreign workers through services such as rehabilitation, counseling, and dorm engagement. It also looks actively into workers' health, safety and well-being through collaborations with tertiary institutions and professionals who kindly donated their time. And what it tries to do is to establish communities of care and inclusion. And in doing so, it also does outreach to promote cultural awareness and raise empathy for foreign workers for corporates and schools through tours like the one you will be embarking on, visits to migrants living in the dormitories and culture exchange programs such as the picture you see here, where such programs promote interactions between migrant workers and the community in order to reduce the barriers between both communities. Next, a little plea for help. We are a charity and charity has limited resources and our existence and our ability to do good work is linked to the kind generosity of the community from within we operate. This is purely optional. And if you can and would like to, please support our ability to do more for our migrant workers through a kind donation, however large or small. Here are the instructions on how to do so. Thank you very much. 
Wishing you a fruitful learning journey as you navigate Little India and seeing it through the sojourner's eyes. This is a presentation brought to you by the School of Health Sciences Neon Polytechnic in collaboration with the Salvation Army Sojourn Programme.